Gorman. Um, this panel is focusing on conflict, ethics, and aesthetics. And I'm really delighted and honored to be on this panel and with this very esteemed group of individuals. And also in this room with this very esteemed group of individuals. It's been a really a stimulating couple of days so far and I really hope with this panel that we can try and have a very open discussion. So I really encourage you please to uh, be engaged, ask questions, any thoughts that come to your mind, please do feel free. Just don't wait for us to try and mark the moment for questions and uh, please just put up your hand if you want to ask anything and we can engage in free and open debate um, which would be nice. So, this panel, Conflict, Ethics and Aesthetics. Now, the, the kind of question that was thrown to us before I get onto the panelists, the question that was thrown to us um, by IETM was looking at the power of the arts to prevent, engage in, and overcome conflicts, which puts a lot of, a lot of pressure, you could be argued, in, on the artists themselves. And to look at to try to prevent conflict and whether arts can prevent conflict, and um, whether the situation in Syria would be different now if just the artists had been a little bit more active, you know, we would have had a nice peaceful transition. Um, but I think there is something in this question of engaging in conflict, and artists and art, if art is engaging in the world as it is, and every piece of art is a political piece of art, art therefore is inherently engaged in conflicts too. Um, a lot of the talk so far has been in terms of looking at freedom of expression as very much a, you know, it's with in some ways the assumption that the expression is going to be benign and good and on the, on the force for good. But as obviously art can also be a tool for engaging in conflict and instrumentalize to both provoke and continue conflict. And I think possibly we'll talk a little bit about this on this panel. However, it can also provoke empathy to those living in times of conflict. And you may be wondering what I'm doing, being chairing this panel, um, being based in the UK. But a lot of the work that we do, both within the Shabak Festival and Highlight Arts, which is an organisation which I was involved in co-founding and works in collaboration with artists in times of conflict, um, looks through this prism of engaging with areas in times of conflict through the arts, and in many ways we could be accused of instrumentalizing the arts in bringing, trying to bring different narratives around people living in areas which happen to be in times of conflict. Um, but at the same time, it could be argued that we are in some ways reinforcing those narratives. So I was looking back over some of the events that I've been involved in since Highland Arts was founded in 2008. Um, so in 2008 we did an event called Creativity versus Destruction, Contemporary Iraqi Art. And then in 2012, Culture Under Fire, Creative Resistance in Syria. 2013, Art, War and Peace, Responses to the Invasion and Occupation of Iraq. 2015, um, Writing in a Time of Conflict and Crisis. And so whilst we're really trying to use the arts as a way to open up discussion and essentially rehumanize areas in times of conflict and people living within them and change that the idea that these are just numbers and somehow abstract, it could be argued at the same time that we're in some ways reinforcing those narratives. And so I'd love to have a discussion with the panel about that. So I'm just going to very briefly introduce the panel and then I'm going to ask them each to make a short intervention of between five to ten minutes and then we'll probably have a little discussion. Oh yes, we have a question already. Yeah, very good. Language question. Please don't forget that for me, I know it's not my modern language. I apologize. Yeah. Do some more. <laughs> Please, thank you. Um, thank you, yeah. And I'm also from Malbec. Malbec is also in the same place. But um, I'm delighted to be joining from left to right with Roger Asaf. Um, <laughs> Roger Asaf. <laughs> an esteemed theater maker, critic, and thinker, and politically engaged artist. Um, based here in Beirut, he'll be telling us about his work and his thoughts on the topic of freedom of expression. Next to him is Judith Knight, who is founder and director of Arts Admin, which is a London-based organization supporting, I would say, some of the most interesting politically engaged performing arts projects in the UK. Then next to me we have Alma, Alma Salam, um, who many of you will know, 
who is from Syria, currently based in Canada, independent arts curator, organizer, and activist. Next to her is Mohamed al Dalaji. Mohamed al Dalaji, um, who spoke yesterday, who is a, a filmmaker and director based in Baghdad and has made numerous films in Iraq since the invasion in 2003. Next to him is Tanya Afkhuri. Tanya Afkhuri, um, a member of the Dictaphone group who uh, appeared, spoke about yesterday, and is a performance artist and theatre maker whose work focuses on the personal and the political. Um, and based between Beirut and London, is that right? Yeah. And then we have Man Abu Talab on the end, who's a writer and thinker, also based between Beirut and London, mainly in Beirut, as of two days ago, I think, Man. Um, and he's a uh, founder of Ma'azif, and we'll be talking about that. So they will all introduce themselves in a bit more depth and talk about specific projects which relate to this theme. But if I can be begin by handing the floor to Roger, um, if you'd be so kind. To present. It's called upon liberation and freedom. We were always enthusiastic for the victories against colonialism and we believed that freedom of expression is uh, very important for us pioneers in democracy. But then afterwards we learned from the recent history and after the disappointment because of what came after communism we learned that the institutions that were built on the basis of freedom and having the conditions of freedom were subjected after all to the interests of the governmental authorities or non-governmental authorities that assign their mechanism and their objective. And our question today is, the freedom that we're calling for, is it a part of the conflict for authority or between the different authorities and powers, or is it a democratic project so that everyone and all people can express themselves and know more about the opinions of others? There is a proverb in Lebanon that says this is a lesson for those who like to learn. Around Lebanon, we have many countries where people are subjected to censorship, to strong censorship. But in Lebanon, we have a certain artificial liberalism, and we have a weak, we have weak governmental institutions in front of uh, sectarianism, and then we have different trends of censorships, governmental censorship, sectarian censorship, social censorship, religious censorship, and we have also a foreign censorship. All of that gives to our media work and to our artistic work some sort of a zigzag or uh, slalom in uh, ski. The development of the relationship between the media and authority make it today that uh, politicians uh, use and abuse so they use the media the way they want and in a way that is only in the interest of the publisher. So it doesn't mean that media is an ally with democracy, and it doesn't mean that it's used for the participation of citizens in politics. This is why it's important to integrate freedom of expression in the right of the professionals of expression, meaning writers, artists, so that the conflict between the freedom of expression and censorship becomes a necessary battle if we want democracy. Of course, I don't want to deny the importance of these rights and the importance of this battle. However, we need to beware of mixing sense and meaning with profession. And we shouldn't limit liberty and freedom and the freedom of expression because liberty and freedom is for everyone. While the expression of freedom 
is not limited to us. I will not stop at what happened recently in uh, Lebanon since 2005, the 8th of March, the 14th of March, and all what followed, all the bazaar that followed. So I will not speak about this. So we have seen a lot of the absence, actually, we saw the absence of impartiality and the media has, has become a slave for its users so each media channel follows the discourse of the one who is dominating it and we don't have a way of receiving the news in an objective way we have more sectarianism more inciting to sectarianism to have a liberal democratic media is something else we see today that in the media we see the sectarianism and how people are divided however we can see that the conflict for power and for authority like everywhere else in the world is linked to the necessity to do something, necessity for action because the media don't find any platform for themselves unless they are backed up by a strong group, by a strong ideology. There is also the financial problem in culture and in media. This is why they need the resources from the capital that are distributed more than any time before based on their belonging to the prevalent politics, which terms and interpretations are made by the interests of different nations. If we look at the different uh, TV uh, channels, we have many questions here about the freedom of the individuals that are there. They don't have opinions. Uh, they have only the opinions of their bosses, of their employers that use their money only to control these media outlets. And if you were to look at what happened recently in France, the country of lights where the freedom of expression was born so if we look at what happened lately in France we are really surprised to see the discrimination that is done under the name of democracy and in the name of freedom of expression I don't want through my sincere intervention but ask a few questions to discuss and I want to remind you of some principles that we find in the collectivity and that makes us meet all together and discuss topics just like what we're doing now under the umbrella of the legal and legislative logic that makes it important to have freedom of expression and journalism, literature and art and to fight for it we find also that there is this possibility of people wanting to asphyxiate uh, this freedom of expression. I need to explain this more, I know. To be able to understand this idea, this paradox between freedom of expression and expressing freedom, reflect upon these concepts. Freedom of expression that is uh, embodied in the Palestinians that are in their occupied lands and the freedom of expression that the Zionists have in the free world. So this expresses freedom but this doesn't have the freedom of expression and the other one enjoys the freedom of expression but expresses the denial of freedom. And we are, of, of course, overlooking both. And we deny also the Islamic terrorism. And we want to acquit ourselves of it so that we can follow the Westerners who sometimes want to show themselves as being partisans of freedom. Freedom of expression, yes. But so that we can express freedom. 
the authority of the politicians and the democracies can paralyze freedom of expression in a dangerous way because they don't need repression and oppression when the individual has no more the will to search for freedom. So they give this to the media and they give their thinking also to this media and they don't want to think anymore themselves. What to say about the different ambitions and practices and the differences between them, I don't know. To defend the freedom of journalism, arts and literature and to defend the freedom of expression, freedom of opinion is a cause that is inevitable. However, these are necessary conditions and insufficient conditions. So necessary but insufficient. The danger lies within the institutions that are asking for it or only exercising it in their own interest. We see it in these institutions, the democratic institutions like the parliament, the syndicates, elections, etc. And the other illusion is considering that the abundance of the new social media that are not controlled by censorship, that they are representing democracy, while we know that the highways and the traffic of the news does not mean that uh, there is democracy, it means that nothing is forbidden anymore because freedom of, of expression means an, a continuous battle to develop the capacity of all people to speak their mind through their access to the ideas of others through communicating with them, which means a new way of thinking to put an end to the inequality of rights. Freedom of expression, yes, but so that we can express freedom. Thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much, Roger. I think this is the given that this panel is focusing on conflict and you were talking about this conflict between freedom of expression and security and inequality of access with a very difficult um, If anybody has any thoughts or reflections or questions as I said at the stage, please do feel free to, to engage. Um, I wanted to ask you, Roger, if I might, also about your, your practical lived experience here in Beirut in terms of offering avenues for free expression through the Shams Theatre. And I wondered if you could just tell us very briefly about the concept in your mind in founding the theatre. Uh, Shams uh, Theatre or the cultural centre of Shams was established from two, based on two ideas. The first idea is giving away to the new creative youth a space so that they can express themselves, so they can meet with each other, especially for those who come from the extremities of our Lebanese society. And second, or the second idea, I founded it so that we can discuss sectarianism not theoretically but practically through finding and implementing works that gather people from different beliefs and different sects in one work but not just in one discussion because discussion comes after work. So for us censorship and uh, freedom of expression here I can say that I never had a problem with censorship in my life. But censorship had a problem with me. <laughs> and this is the main difference that makes my work important. Because I don't care about censorship. I say what I want to say, whatever the conditions of censorship are. And then the censorship will have a problem 
because they need to find a window so that they can interfere and uh, reduce the impact of what I'm doing. So I don't think about censorship, I don't care about it, but they will have to think about me. Thank you very much. شكرا جزيلا لك. أما الآن فسأنتقل إليك جودف. Microphone please. This is possible because I'm in Lebanon, but in another country it's not possible. Maybe I would have been in exile or in prison. شكرا جودف. هل يمكن أن تقدم لنا لمحة عامة عن العمل It's also strange to be on this panel from the UK because, of course, we have our own conflicts, we have increasing inequality, we have huge divisions, we have the disaster that is Brexit, and we have an increasing and very frightening amount of anti foreigner rhetoric, which uh, talking about Fortress Europe this morning, I think it's also talking about whether thinking about Fortress UK, because at the moment our attitude is even Europeans are foreigners, let alone everybody else. So it's, it's a scary moment, I think, in the history of our country. And but here am I in, in, in the Middle East. It's amazing to be here, but surrounded by countries that have suffered much more than we have. In fact, the embarrassing thing is, and the shameful thing is, that Britain has been responsible for much of this, uh, right from the carving up of the Middle East and drawing lines in the sand many years ago. Uh, without even talking about so many uh, disastrous interventions in Iraq. So I should walk out with a big badge here saying, I'm sorry, it's not my fault. Um, even Ireland, you know, went down into one. We've, we've not got a great history, I have to say. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit of what we're trying to do in, uh, in reparation, maybe, uh, with some of the answers that we will work with. Uh, if I can. So this is us, and we're based in East London, and this is our building. Um, sorry, I've got the brilliant help. And, um, and we work with artists across all disciplines, from visual arts to theatre to uh, gallery, galleries and theatres, and a lot, as we again were talking about yesterday, in the public realm. Um, I thought that the organisation terrifying me 37 years ago. Um, these are some of the projects we've done outdoors, and a lot of the work increasingly is participatory, uh, involving members of the public in it uh, and across the country. I'm not going to talk about these projects, but just to give you a view of the sort of things we might end up doing on our beaches in Scotland. This was actually in Derry, which uh, some of you will know is a very divided city in this But this project here was the first one I was going to talk to which, about, which was a project by Graham Miller, who uh, has been going for some time now. But Graham went to track all the places in Europe and North America where people have literally fallen from a plane. There are, I think, trapped about 35 people who have tried to get into Europe, asylum seekers or people seeking better life by actually hanging on to the, the wheel hub of the aeroplane and unbelievably staying there until the plane lands and comes into Heathrow or JFK or Charlotte. And Graham, these people just disappear. And what Graham wanted to go and make a memorial to these people, so he tracked many of these sites around Europe and around the world and took an image of them into the sky and name the person and it sort of becomes a memorial. And for me this is something that the arts can do 
it can actually put a name to victims, it can put a name to refugees, it can put a name to and a life, and actually instead of looking at people in numbers, the answers we can actually look at people as human beings and their lovers, their families, their wives, and it's something that's an important part of the art can play. Um, it, it is interesting in recent years more and more artists are coming to us with projects that are about issues. Um, we, as I said, we've been going for many years, so often before we were still doing wonderful art, but I think the artists are feeling that they want to do more about the current state of the world. And for me, I don't really have a problem with artists being used as instruments, if you like, as long as they want to do it, so then we can never force an artist to say, do a project on that list together, but of course it, it's coming from the heart of us. So I see my job as encouraging to, to make that work. This project I'm hardly going to speak about because Tanya is here on the panel. But this is done exactly what for me I found is profoundly moving. We were honoured to have given a tiny anniversary for this, but it's gone on and on and she'll tell you all about it. But again, it does the same thing. It brings those people, uh, it gives you the lives and the stories of those people. Um, this is another project we're currently doing in development, and I'm hoping it's actually going to Downs Festival next summer. This is a company called Station House Opera, and they're working with a team of performers in Gaza, and of course, neither can get to each other's country, so it's a telematic performance that actually, they're merging into each other as their spaces are merging into each other, but they're also their bodies and their performances, and they're talking to each other and relating. And it's in very early stages, and we can take a couple of years to to develop, I think, but it's um, it's interesting to me that the Gazans don't want to talk about the conflict. They want to talk about the daily life they're having, and they want to connect with the daily life of London performers. And there was, uh, as an academic, as many of you have probably heard of James Thompson, who's done a lot of research into things and actually drawn up a sort of matrix that actually it's easier to talk and make a performance about conflict if you're further away in, in space and time or further away in miles and then it is if you're in the middle of the place of the conflict. Often you will be making work but maybe not about the conflict itself. Uh, in this case, this will develop I hope in 2017-2018. Um, empathy, we talked a lot about these things today uh, as well. Uh, empathy is again similarly it's a, it's a bit short on the ground at the moment, especially in the UK. This artist, Claire Haiti, has made a project called the Museum of Empathy. And one, one of these projects is called The Mile in My Shoes, which is the, and many of you know the expression, walk a mile in my shoes and you'll understand about my life. And so this project, you have to wear somebody else's shoes and walk half a mile there and half a mile back. You must wear the shoes, whether they're high heel shoes or relative boots or whatever. And you listen to the story of a stranger. So again, it's trying to make the other into somebody you understand and then. And this is developing this project. She's already done it in several places, and it's growing in the stories that come with it to grow with it. So it's again incredibly important. And then again, I mean, this is interesting because climate change is, is it conflict? Yes, I think it will be. So, in a way, we're doing a lot of work about the issue of climate change. Um, we are part of the Imagine 2020 network, which is a European lots of organisations, including uh, Tyson, to be used here as well. And all of us are making work about the issue of environment because if we do, for us this is the most important subject. If we don't address this properly, then the refugee crisis will be unspeakable. Uh, and we'll make what we've got going on now look, look simple. So this is a we think this is a major cause of our work and it's it's a really important uh, direction of going. This project it's called the Museum of Water, and it's by an artist called Amy Sharrocks. It's bringing to attention the necessity of water, the most precious resource we have. And she's got about six or seven donations of bottles of water from people bring the water with the story attached. It has to be, it has to have a story. It might be your baby's first have bath water. It might be an empty bottle of water where there is a drought. It might be a water from a flood. We will have a little bit of water from the. Um, the ice cap on the in the Antarctic, which is a hundred the vial of hundred and twenty nine thousand year old water. Um, and so we do a festival every two years called Two Degrees Festival, which is again about art, activism and climate change. 
and I'm just showing the images, I'm not really explaining the process. It varies from work indoors and outdoors. A lot of it participates in getting the audience engaged and it's not just for the audience to work. And in terms of conflict, there were two projects I wanted to bring up. We produced of this beautiful film installation by Zarina Vinci called Pachanga, which is, is, also, is an exquisite piece of work, and I think it's talking about aesthetics and conflict in the same in the same sentence because it's so beautiful to look at the sounds and the problem, but it's it's all the way through has got this incredible strong hint of the colonial past it shot in Kenya and it through the sound in the subtlest way, the sound of the image she brings about what happened to this the land and the history of it. And there's a project I haven't got with me because we didn't produce, but I just wanted to in case anybody had ever seen it, and listening to one of the artists this morning talking about snipers. There was an organisation in London called Art Age and they commissioned two artists from Sarajevo to make a film called 1395 Days Without Rent, which was the most extraordinary thing I think I've seen. I wish it had been a project we've done. And it was just people queuing up to try and cross the street. Uh, there was no glass, there was no gunfire. It was just people walking to the end of the street and waiting to see if they dare cross. And the tension and the fear that you feel by watching it, even though it was, you know, it had a Tchaikovsky background, but it was, there was nothing violent to see, it was absolutely incredibly strong and gave me a stronger impression of imagining living in that city and that scene than I've ever, I've ever seen, I should say. And then, I mean, that's it. I mean, the question I always ask myself is, does it make any difference? Is it totally irrelevant? Um, here we are having this conversation in this amazing place, and it's only over the walls that what is going on in Aleppo is unimaginable. And so sometimes in my doomiest moments, I think I'm not making any difference at all. But you have to think you are, I suppose. You have to think to carry on. It will make a difference in the end. Um, the question is, I suppose, are we only reaching, I mean, we'll discuss all these things, I guess, for audiences who will come anyway and totally believe what we all believe. Can we fight tyranny with art? I love the Picasso quote saying painting isn't done to decorate departments, it's an instrument of war. Uh, is it more authentic when the work's made with the people who are suffering in the conflict or about the people? There was a, there's a, some of you again will have heard of an Argentinian director called Lola Arias who made two extraordinary pieces of work. One with the sons and daughters of the Pinochet's victims and Pinochet's supporters and more recently one with soldiers from Falklands, from English and Argentinian soldiers, on stage together, which is really quite an extraordinary thing. But again, is the arts and what are we affecting everything? And that age-old question of the photographer taking a photo of the dying child, is it more useful that he says the child tries to, or more useful that he takes the photograph to tell the world what's going on? Um, when I do get the um, which is quite often, uh, I come back to this uh, quote by a Scottish writer called A.L. Kennedy, who just gives me a bit of hope that uh, we are doing something useful. I might read just that line from the translation, but it says, I believe in what we might call unnecessary beauty in art. As an artist, I would say that, but then again, individuals and groups have sought to control or extinguish populations, to marginalise or demonise. They seem to believe in the power of art even more than I do. They ardently seek out to restrict those intimate, idiosyncratic joys we find in the songs we sing, the stories that travel with us, the verses that sustain us, the paintings and drawings and sculptures and windows and buildings and voices and performances, images that lift us and give us dignity, the things that show us the light in our world and in ourselves, the things that show us individual human beings have the power to create wonders which outlast them, which transcend every classification of gender, race, religion, nationality, or age. And I think that always cheers me up. So basically, tyrannical regimes and dictators, if they really in the power of the art, then we have better too. And if we can't stop the barrel bombs of today, we have to hope we'll make a difference tomorrow. Thank you.
much to you. Um, yeah, <laughs> we can start. Um, no, that was really, really wonderful. I just want to ask you one question. Um, when just at the very beginning, even before you made your presentation, you said um, the work that you did was in preparation. Um, and I wonder, do you, do you feel that it is in some way, I know that it's, you know, maybe it's like something unique, but do you feel that in some way that there is a duty for organisations based in the UK or in countries where there is obviously a, a huge power imbalance in terms of the, the conflict engagement with the other countries that you may be working with, ours is from Syria or based in Syria, ours is based in Iraq, etc. Do you feel that there is a duty for organisations based in the UK to engage with these regions and to engage with conflicts that the UK is at least involved in the same Well, I do, I do. I mean, I, we, we don't, we don't bring in companies into our venue or anything from anywhere much. I mean, that mostly we're working with UK companies, but I think, I think there is a duty upon us all. But, and I really think there's a duty upon artists. I really don't go along with artists not needing to take, uh, take this stuff seriously. If they're able to do it, they should do it. And I think the, the best thing we could hope to do is change attitudes in the UK particularly. And I think I think, as I said before, I think the issues of, of the refugees. I mean, Britain is going to take 20,000 refugees to Syria. 20,000. Over four years. That's 5,000 a year. At one point, we're 1,000 a day going to Lesbos. So that's pretty shaming. I do all, so actually, I think, and the press, I mean, like you were talking about the press, the right wing press is, is, is the, all the talk about asylum seekers. And it's very, very negative. And I think if we, if we can do anything at all, we can change attitudes to those people in the Middle East who are at least trying to get out of the countries they can't live in anymore for the time being. And I think that even if it's changing the UK minds, it's at least doing something. But who knows? It's a, it's a struggle. I would, I would like to do a little survey of all the audience members saying, How have you had your mind changed? And then just you mentioned the audiences as well, reaching to the conversion. And obviously, this group we have in the room is a very socially or artistically and correctly engaged and socially engaged group. Um, I sometimes wonder about the work that we do if we should actually be trying to form media partnerships with you know, the Daily Mail or the right wing newspapers in the UK to try and reach out to new audiences because the work that we tend to do, even if we do work in the public realm, still the majority of coverage we get is from you know, the kind of more left leaning newspapers and this kind of thing. And I think it is a real challenge and something that we need to try and think about and do this kind of work is how do we break out of these bubbles. Um, I'd like to move on now, if I may. Um, I'm going to move on to Mohammed. I'm going to jump around. Mohammed, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to uh, move on to you. And um, so, can we get a microphone? I'll try and use that one. Uh, so, Mohammed Al Ghazi uh, was on one of the panels yesterday, and some of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with his work. So, um, Mohammed is a hugely talented filmmaker who's been working um, based between the UK and Iraq, but now primarily based in Iraq. That's correct. Um, and he's made a number of feature films uh, filmed in Iraq. And so, Mohammed, I wanted to first just ask you a little bit about, I suppose, your filmmaking career in engaging with Iraq. A uh, film that I know that from your catalog that I first really engaged with Iraq was Ahmad. Is that correct? Um, and so. Could you maybe tell us a little bit, I'm sure some, some, many here will have seen it, but could you tell us maybe a little bit about the film and when you made it and why you decided to make it? Um, I used to study in the UK when my elites and then the world started in Iraq in 2003. And um, I saw a reportage on BBC about the mental institution Baghdad and how it was hit by the bomb. And then I saw a girl, um, she went and write this, this reportage, and uh, she speak a uh, non-understandable language, either Kurdish or Arabic or any of the language. So the image of this girl shocked me. Just about the war to finish, I was lucky to finish my name, and I went to Baghdad. And I saw the city how it was damaged by the war in 2003, and it's like a city that I don't know anything about it, so 
was like a sunstorm hit the city all the time. And everything is being changed, the color of the dirt. So, I saw my family, my family was born to the house where we were, we had born to build the wall and big disaster. And then I went to the medical institutions. And I was looking for this girl, and I couldn't sit with her for a different condition. And then I started to hear the story, what had happened in during the war, and how the mental institution was going to. And then I spent about four weeks going there every day, and started to write my first feature film there. And the question that I raised, who is like really ill? People that make the war, or the people that's ill in the title? Sit in bed and they try to avoid any contact with the, with the normal people. And um, shooting it in the war zone, where uh, there is no thing exists called uh, normal. You need to be also abnormal and you need to find your way of uh, putting things together. And you end it in place uh, a lot of difficult and uh, a lot of problems, and, and you become angry. Like the situation, and they are challenged. No, no, I can't challenge them. Easy. Ah, for um, for any habit, habit is present in every place. For any habit. So it was and at the same time have a clashing cough in the other hand. And uh, but I want didn't want to kill yeah, people. So uh, um, my staff was telling me you're coming from Europe and making uh, fun of us, so why are you holding this uh, gun, this arm? Um, we had the many, many different uh, situations. We were uh, arrested by the uh, Americans. They considered that we were part of the Qaeda, making uh, movies for Al Qaeda and that we are the remainder of al Ba'ath's uh, party and uh, we face problem with uh, Shiite uh, Shia militias as well so uh, we faced many problems in Iraq back then it was very difficult but we find a pleasure a pleasure as a human being Wherever you are, you need to seek your, your routine, to find your presence, the essence of your presence, to be in a place and discover yourself, because our journey as human beings is or aims at the discovering oneself and uh, all uh, this uh, human crisis are in my point of view positive experience because life is not uh, made of always made of good moments but we have to live the bad so that was our journey we made the movie and uh, our work uh, uh, started to develop in Iraq and uh, in the times of violence and war and especially when you are in the middle of uh, bombs and uh, shellings you ask yourself what is the art what is cinema is it a big lie we hear art about art about cinema about defending your personal opinion but when you are in the middle of life and death you uh, make fun of yourself and the people start to make fun uh, about themselves and you because it's a kind of irony in the middle of all this destruction you are trying to hold a camera and uh, sing a song uh, we used to think when having the camera on, we have a country, we have Iraq, if you want me to sing it. No, no, I won't be singing it. And then we... You want me to sing? 
in the in our in my movie Ahlam, the I say that my country is the joy, is the dream, is everything. And when the 35 is on, we are alive, we are the humans, etc. So it was like a, a fun song. What I want to say is that in the middle of uh, war and destruction, we created life and we started a partnership with the Iraqi uh, association that uh, was supporting the creation of uh, cinema and uh, uh, trying to make sure that uh, the cinema is a guarantee for our presence. What I want to comment concerning our discussion, now I'm talking only about uh, Iraq and that can be generalized. What happened in Iraq expected that art will be so diminished and far from people and that's why the oppressive and the dictatorship ideas uh, take control over anything that we can see. We have to ask ourselves a question as artists. There's a public. Are we close to that public? Are we communicating with that public directly? And maybe the lack of communication may the, the culture of violence uh, prevail. And now we are seeing its repercussions in many countries. We all have one uh, concern from uh, Algeria to Iraq to Afghanistan because violence is everywhere. And that's why I hope that we as artists ask ourselves, uh, is our art and the culture uh, a reason that led our people uh, to, where, uh, to where they are? And maybe we uh, bear some of the responsibility. <laughs> I think that's a really interesting point that you end on in terms of the responsibility. Just before though, I wanted to ask you a, a question about you know, reflecting on the topic of this panel and looking at ethics and ethics of working in areas in terms of conflict. I wonder, it must, it must have been challenging for you to come from the UK to Iraq in a time of conflict and then have a local crew working and necessarily endangering their lives to fulfill the project of the artist. And I wonder about some of the ethical questions around that, how you dealt with that both within Atlam, but also within your later catalog, because obviously you've stayed working in Iraq, and I'm sure those questions haven't necessarily gone away. What will happen with you? Where do you want to reach, especially in moments of weakness, moments where we used to cry, uh, where we used to be in the midst of killing? The killing was in front of us. We were in uh, Haifa Street, the death street, and we witnessed the killing of uh, men. So you ask yourself, what is the cinema that you are trying to create uh, and to make when people are uh, being killed in front of you or a colleague is shot when, uh, uh, when working? So this question will uh, accompany you. And you will have to ask yourself, uh, do you believe in what you do? And are you willing to sacrifice yourself and the others, especially when you are responsible? Because the responsibility is something very critical. You have to be responsible of yourself and all the artists and the crew. 
But the strange thing is that when you enter the moment of the crisis or the problem, you won't be asking these questions. You have a problem and you will try to address this problem or be a part of the solution. And after uh, every movie I make or every workshop I make in Iraq, I always ask myself this question. Was it worth it? My, my coming here is worth it. But uh, I was very encouraged when all the projects that we were doing were far away from the people of Iraq. We were Many people from outside Iraq watched my movies, but uh, Iraqis uh, didn't. And now, after the uh, project, the moving uh, cinema, we were able to uh, transfer and to move with uh, our movies in the different Iraqi cities and uh, villages. And when you see uh, people that are not related to art, how they react, the happiness on their face, that will give you an extra motivation as well. My colleagues coming from Britain or France or the US, Italy, etc., when accompanying me uh, during the shooting of the movie, they are all afraid, first of all, having many questions in mind concerning what they are coming to do. and. Uh, between you and I, sometimes I even lie in order to incite them to come. But when they enter Baghdad or the environment we have created in Baghdad, uh, they uh, immediately feel very happy and work very actively forgetting about the violence. We've discussed uh, with uh, you and I, and you've asked me about Baghdad. I've told you that in Baghdad you have 0.0.0.0.8% 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. of being uh, dead uh, per day. That are up to 8 million. So you can, in a place of violence, uh, create things. But always this question will remain, why are you doing this? Uh, why uh, am I creating this? That might stop you for a moment, but you will soon come back. Thank you very much. And the, the film was called the Mobile Arab. Jazilan. Thank you. Um, Atlan, which we started talking about, is a really truly remarkable film, and I encourage you if you haven't seen it, seek it out. But also, all the films of Mohammed Al Damaji will say the same thing. So it's a really remarkable fact that a lot of films being created in Iraq since 2003. Um, if I may now move on, I'm going to go to Alma now, right? So Alma, you wouldn't mind having the microphone. Thank you, Dan. Hello, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, putting this session uh, on the program. Um, uh, it's really um, very rewarding to finally start talking about conflict and ethics and, and uh, aesthetics rather than only focusing on the role of artists in time of conflict. I think we've, we've been talking about this uh, for uh, five years now. So it's, and uh, at the same time, the, the question of ethics uh, uh, and uh, making the case for it, uh, for it um, keeps uh, roaming among us. Is this art uh, produced? Uh, is it quality art? Can we call it art? And all those questions, I think that it's also very legitimate to question ourselves uh, what, what we're we doing and how do we link this to all the ethical, uh, ethical questions of public. 
But I will start by challenging the, the title. Um, uh, how was it? Uh, no, preventing. Oh, that's. Yeah. The power of the arts to prevent yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, I, I don't think that anyone in the world can prevent conflict. I think that conflict is, is, uh, is a natural uh, process. It's like life and it's like death. No one can stop conflict. Uh, I also believe that, uh, on the contrary, art. Uh, provide the platforms and the legitimacy for conflict. This is what I said in the first session, if you remember. It's the only stage, it's the only place where it's pleasure to kill someone, uh, to express anger, to, uh, to do a hate speech. And I'm for embracing all those um, ugliness and all those hideous uh, aspects of, 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 of conflict and to support artists and art spaces to be a safe space for any kind of expression, including the, the obvious one. Um, uh, in order to tackle the link between aesthetics and ethics and conflict, I would like to ask the question uh, about the uh, about, uh, legitimacy of an avant-garde movement. Can we speak about an avant-garde movement in the region? And can we say that this was a creative revolution? I think that the, uh, uh, maybe an influence to, uh, to linking aesthetics to conflict is back to the world that we all love and we started to forget revolution. Was this a creative revolution? So critics like Clark and Foster uh, tell us uh, that the legitimacy of the avant-garde, we can talk about the avant-garde movement if it was built on a comprehensive critic of the bourgeoisie. Uh, of course, this is really the old times, uh, old times, but I think that we can build on this theory and we can say, yes, uh, the new artwork, uh, they, they did a uh, criticism not only to bourgeoisie as a class, but also to all systems of values uh, in the societies in the region. Uh, they they uh, it criticized, uh, and we saw a rapid uh, expansion of conceptualism. We saw new, uh, new ideas. We, uh, we saw a need to, uh, de uh, to distract and also uh, to distract the falling dominant ideologies of uh, aesthetics, like for example the bad ideologies, uh, uh, aesthetic values. We can talk about this very much and we know that it can narrow down to the simple cover of uh, books that we, we used to uh, have at school. So we can talk about a lot of values of aesthetics that the revolution or the new conflict managed to deconstruct. Uh, de uh, um, so in the case of our group in the region, we went even more far in this project. So not only targeting social group, uh, groups, but also uh, tackling social issues like corruption, injustice, abuse of freedoms and others. And, uh, and also, uh, over the past years, since 2011, the creative expression moved from stillness of ideas to perplex new zones of exploration. Uh, from evident to the doubtful, we started doubting. And from a set of clear, narrow answers imposed by hideous dogmas and regimes to an open space of new questioning and questions. And I believe that this is one of the key roles for, for what art uh, does. It's not about answering, what's answering, uh, putting answers, but it's mainly about questioning. And this is, this is where critical thinking uh, comes really high as a priority. So it's also, uh, we, we've seen openness to new global trends of genuine solidarity and new friendships and new circles in the art. I won't call it new institutions, but I won't call it new circles in the art. All this, I believe, responds to that question of uh, legitimacy and link between aesthetics and, uh, and conflict. Um, the question is that um, this is a new set of ethics, aesthetics, uh, that uh, embraces conflict. Um, yeah, did it happen because this historical moment uh, among the regional artistic community created a sudden need for research, uh, for finding new resources for, of education, of skills, uh, also across all genres? Is it because we witnessed the birth of new definitions, new experimentations, creative processes, and new genres? 
Is it because of the pressure uh, to express in a more in-depth level of sophistication? So really we saw for the first time uh, the need to, to, be, to be sophisticated in times where this wasn't necessarily a need in the past set of values. Uh, on those issues, I might come back later on, but I, I believe that uh, uh, this is a, a good entrance to linking, uh, to start linking maybe and linking and considering all those issues and challenging ourselves. Did we go through a, a creative revolution? Can we speak about this? Did we see uh, results and change at the level of aesthetic in our region? Thank you, Omar. I think there's a question or a point from the back to a microphone. As well, Mike is making its way. What you said there about the questions that are giving answers reminded me of a quote from a collective called Nassassanati, who you will know. And um, we interviewed for an IETM publication on arts and politics, and they said that arts is the unique gift of being able to provoke and make people react to question and challenge without being forced to give answers and solutions, um, which may be bringing similar bells to what you were just saying. Now, the other point from the back of that. Um, yeah, thank you for your remarks there. You, you got me thinking we, um, it's uh, 2016 and uh, 100 years ago with the birth of the Dada movement uh, in the middle of World War One in Europe, in Zurich. Um, and so to commemorate that and also because there is uh, a striking parallel with the situation of the region right now that is indulged basically in barbarity, um, we're going to be hosting, uh, uh, presenting basically a data exhibition here in November. And some of the questions we're having, so we cannot bring original works from there, but uh, you know, we're going to reproduce some works. But we're also looking to uh, collaborate with uh, artists here, primarily Debanese, but if, from the discussions here, there are any. Uh, regional artists who also kind of engage with some of the questions that were brought up uh, just now. Um, yeah. uh, you know, about questioning aesthetics, about questioning um, the, the situation that we're in, about the role of politics, about the role of the arts uh, in uh, addressing some of the social political issues we have. That uh, offers that kind of uh, opportunity because that's that's what we're about. Anti-establishments, anti-bourgeois values, uh, anti-art, uh, and they look for different ways to, to try and uh, get their message across. So I don't know of a data movement per se in the region. I don't know. Um, so, but it's, it's an interesting uh, stone that we're throwing out there, uh, and hopefully we'll get some discussion going about um, art, dada, dada. <laughs> Other weird things that dada did. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, thank you for the uh, for putting this in a framework of a definition. I think this is what we uh, didn't uh, work on uh, yet uh, in a good way. I think we might have a data movement in one of the countries or across the region, but we didn't yet work out on definitions. And I believe maybe it's too early, maybe it's not yet uh, a generation of new practices, maybe it's only flourishing, uh, but uh, it's, it's absolutely uh, very valid to start doing this and in comparison with the, with the movement in history, that would be amazing. So thank you for working on this. And if I could just ask one question, just in brief, I know this is we can say, but we're exciting for the time. But if you could tell us, I know you have a lot through your practical engagement with the work, and I wonder if you could just briefly tell us about um, the third space exhibition and the project which you put together in a couple of sentences. Okay. Well, the third space uh, is a platform to showcase uh, artwork. It's called Serial Third Space. It's going to hopefully develop to third space. 
um, it started, um, it was based on a research uh, by uh, uh, around a uh, team of grants, uh, around 100 grants given to Syrian artists by the British Council uh, uh, between 2011 and 2014. And then appeared, uh, after this research and the uh, grant scheme, that appeared the need to showcase uh, uh, some of uh, the results of this, these grants. So this is how it started. Uh, the, the concept of third space uh, comes from a theory developed by the artist Packer, an American artist in the 60s, where he, uh, it, it is the origin of uh, the philosophy of the social space. It is a space that uh, uh, embraces talent, that is flexible, that is free, that has no borders. Uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, also at the same time uh, is like an agora, it's a space for uh, negotiation, for democracy, for ideas, uh, and uh, that was the idea. So I took the metaphor of the third space, which is a known theory, and uh, I compared this to the situation of the Syrian artists who were in uh, displacement, trying to find a space that overcome the issues of, uh, of borders, the issues of visa, the issues of mobility, the issues of censorship. So the statement of this space is that it is a space that uh, where, an, uh, where uh, an artwork can move, where the artist doesn't need to be there uh, to, in order to exhibit or to disseminate his work. Uh, it is a multimedia, uh, mostly digital uh, platform. Uh, it was incubated uh, uh, in the British Council. It's a touring exhibition that started in London and uh, went to the European Parliament and to Northern Ireland. But the key thing about it also is that the toolkit of educational toolkit. Uh, in this the third phase, I did the first Twitter tour, a global Twitter tour, where I had people from around the world following me to. Uh, to talk about the exhibition, so many exciting uh, social platform engagement and also curated conversations. Whatever it is, uh, it, uh, it lands somewhere. It's it also a try to create a discussion around this, especially about I think uh, uh, at the time we focus on the role of image and what's graphic and not graphic versus ethical, ethics, etc. Uh, but uh, yeah, well, again. Thank you. Sorry that was such a rough introduction, but a great overview. And I think that idea of the Twitter tour is really interesting in terms of the audiences that we were talking about and getting, trying to get wider audiences engaged. Something we haven't really talked about over the last couple of days really is the digital public sphere and how to radicalize and mobilize and, and engage that. Um, if I may now hand on to uh, Tanya al Khoury. Um, um, Tanya um, is a very talented director and artist based between, mainly in Beirut, but between Beirut and London. And I think you're going to talk about Garden Speak, is that right, Tanya? Yeah. Um, and Garden Speak, you saw one image of um, Judith's presentation, but are you going to show a short film of it? Uh, yeah, I think if there are people who have seen it, sure. I think a lot of people have seen it. Already. Hands up if you have not seen Garden Speak. Oh, wow. oh okay, wow. Good, I thought I was going to go. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Poor people. Well, you will see a little bit there. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about the Arab world. I'm going to talk to you about the Arab world. About uh, my work, and first of all, thank you, Dan. I would like to thank the organizers and the station. I'm very happy to be in a discussion with people that I respect a lot and people that are from both sides of my life, from London and from Beirut. I'll be speaking about two shows, but I think we have enough time only to speak about one show. So I'll be speaking about Garden Speak. And I'll speak about this relationship between aesthetics and uh, conflicts, political conflicts. Garden Speak was presented actually here in the station a few months ago within the Spring Festival. It was really touching for me to be able to present it here in Beirut after it was presented in more than 15 countries around the world. It's called in Arabic Al Hadaik Tahki Garden Speak. Maybe many of you saw this, saw it, or actually hosted it, hosted its display. Now, for those who don't know what it is, I will show you a short 
uh, scene so that you'll understand better what I'll be speaking about. Thank you. In this uh, session, I'll be speaking about the concept. Yeah, I think if there are people who haven't seen it, sure. Because I think a lot of people have seen it. Already. Hands up if you have not seen Garden Speak. Oh, oh look at that. Good, I thought you were just. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> you poor people. Well, you will see a little bit about uh, my work and first of all thank you Dan I would like to thank the organizers and the station I'm very happy to be in a discussion with people that I respect a lot and people that are from both sides of my life from London and from Beirut I'll be speaking about uh, two shows, but I think we have enough time only to speak about one show, so I'll be speaking about Garden Speak. And I'll speak about this relationship between aesthetics and uh, conflicts, political conflicts. Garden Speak was presented actually here in the station a few months ago within the Spring Festival. It was really touching for me to be able to present it here in Beirut after it was presented in more than 15 countries around the world. It's called in Arabic Al Hadaik Tahki Garden Speak. Maybe many of you saw the saw it or actually hosted it, hosted its display. Now for those who don't know what it is, I will show you a short uh, scene so that you'll understand better what I'll be speaking about. Thank you. In this uh, session, I'll be speaking about the concept of interactivity and the political dimension of interaction, first of all, between the artists and the participants in the work. So here I mean the people that told us about the, the stories of their children, the activists and the journalists uh, that you were able to interview and who gave us uh, information as well as the other artists that participated in this work, the writers, the people who worked on the sound, sound engineers. And we have the other side that is a particular dimension of this relationship between this work and the audience. And of course, we can speak a lot about each of these relationships. But in brief, it was very important for me to search about the thin line between the political meaning of this project that is uh, proposing a discourse uh, that is against the prevalent dictatorship discourse or the international media, and then open a discussion about how to use death to oppress people and to oppress uh, the popular uprising or also kidnapping the corpses and uh, not allowing them to uh, bury their death. So even if it, was, if it was only through 10 stories, it was still the beginning of the incidents. It wasn't yet a war in Syria. So we had stories of different people, of regular people. Some of them were activists, but others were only normal people, like, for example, a teacher, a person who had a grocery store. And we have also the work itself and the audience. Here we can speak about the aesthetics, about finding the political dimension of this relationship as well. For example, I'll speak quickly about uh, these items, about these bullet points. This presentation happens without a performer. I usually participate in the performance of my shows, but in this show, I decided that it wasn't important to have a performer because this is not my story. I wanted to create an intimate space between the audience and the stories that they were listening to. It was very important also to interact in a bodily way with, in a physical way with the story because there are people on the ground using their hand to dig in the soil. They were also writing a letter addressed to these people, then burying it 
So they were really putting themselves in their story so that they are really testifying about these people. And I noticed to which extent the audience puts itself in the place in the shoes of these people. So when they're writing a letter, they're speaking about themselves and not about the martyrs. So they think that if they were in his shoes, what would have they done? Or maybe they should have uh, taken other courage and brave uh, attitudes in other moments of their life. So uh, this artistic language that I chose, <laughs> this artistic language that was chosen is this, and it also has a political dimension. It was really great for me to see how many people saw the show. They were really surprised that the place was nice and that how it was equipped also was nice. They expect that when an artist has a political attitude, then uh, this artist won't give enough attention to aesthetics, uh, to creativity, and to the relationship of the audience with uh, the show, which was not true. It, so it was a long uh, debate, and it's happening everywhere in the world about the relationship between the aesthetics and the political content. And many critics and many Artists are sometimes facing uh, contradictions in this uh, regard. So, of course, there is a problem for me in such criticism because it separates aesthetics from politics. And I think, or I'm trying to discover this through my work, aesthetics, or choosing aesthetics, the choice of aesthetics is also political and has a political dimension, especially when it comes to the relationship with the audience and the content of the show. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tanya. Thank you, Tanya. Some more detail with you. Can I just ask you um, two brief points? One on aesthetics, which you, you were talking about. And this is also something I was thinking about when uh, Mahan was speaking. Um, both of you are dealing with situations, I mean, Garden Speak specifically is dealing with possibly one of the worst situations you could possibly have. And yet you've created something with this strong aesthetic vision, and that you, know, you could say is a, a beautiful creation. And how did you, when approaching that, make, try and make that balance between the beauty of the creation of your aesthetic vision and the story that you were trying to tell? I mean, as I said, I don't think it's very much divided. Uh, sorry, <laughs> We need to have a new idea, an innovative idea, or the language of uh, the show, the artistic language of the show, is not contradictory with the political content, on the contrary, because it is political itself. So there is no contrast here. For me, they come together, meaning the content and the picture, the artistic picture. So when I first started hearing about uh, people who were buried in gardens in Syria, this was really important for me, and I wanted to know why it's happening like this in the political, on the political level. And also, I wanted to see this picture of uh, people being buried in such intimate places and because these gardens were actually gardens like yards around the houses and not public yard, uh, not public gardens so, so through this show I wanted people to see this everywhere in the world and you could put your ear on the ground and feel their stories so I invented the content myself and I created this uh, artistic language for it I think that the beauty is a valley and on the valley you see thank you Okay. 
Um, just to pop up one other question for you, if I may, just in terms of audiences, we've talked a bit about audiences. And I wonder for you, well, two questions. One, are audiences important? And then two, if they are, why a lot of the work that you make tends to be, uh, the Garden Speak was for 10 people at a time, was it? 10 people. And your more recent work, as far as my fingertips take me, is for one at a time, is that right? And so why have you chosen to go on these very intimate and kind of low, uh, low density audience productions? Uh, so I do a lot of work for only one people at a time, one person at a time, or three people at a time, or ten people at a time. La Ele, uh, So because for me, yes, very important, and I always uh, think about the targeted audience. It's never one an audience, actually. These are people who participate with me in the work. It's either people who are coming to visit where someone is buried or they participate with me in a certain game. There is always a role that is played by the audience, and I deal with the audience as a collaborator and not as a spectator only. So there are people who are collaborating with me in this show. This is why we always reach this intimate relationship, and this is why I don't have big groups of people. It's uh, like only one person, three persons, or ten persons at a time, because they have this role to play, and because the work is that intimate and interactive, and it asks people to be interactive, but also give their political viewpoint and not remain outside the story or outside the content. So they need to participate and show what their political viewpoint is. This is why it's important for me to be in this intimate, with this intimate audience. I have a quick uh, comment. As a project is, re is really great and marvelous. And your idea is wonderful, but with all due respect, for one person, for three persons, this is one of the things that make me think that in culture and when you work with people, we need to think about a wider audience, not just uh, the audience that is from the middle class or the elite. No, we know that we can always have this elite. They're always with us and our ideas and the changes that we have. But no, we want the other audience. We are proposing questions to our audience, not giving them solutions. Let's say it's Dash or Mash or Jash. So let's bring them and introduce them to our projects. Let them uh, touch the soil where they killed these people. Many of these ideas should be taken by us and conveyed to the regular people that need us now, especially in our regions, because unfortunately we face many problems because of the ignorance, because of the authorities that uh, let us reach this phase, this despotism where people don't really interact with the real culture and Syria and Iraq are the examples about that and here we're speaking about two states with one party, the Ba'ath party. Okay, I will answer you. Yes, uh, you're right. I agree we need to always think about how the shows uh, need to be shows need to be seen by wider audiences, not only by the elite or by small groups. But usually, these shows are repeated uh, many times through the day and through the night. And I always think about how my work can come out of go out of the art institutions. So I do a lot of work in public spaces in Beirut through the Ktaphone group. And here we have people who come as participants, but there are also the accident there is also the accidental audience that is just there and then they find out that they're uh, an audience to my show. So even my work that is not done in the public spaces I try to do it outside the art institutions like in coffee shops and the street 
So yes, I agree with you. Thank you very much. Um, Shukran, and one Lankan. way, yeah, one way I think you also try and get the story out effectively is through through the media. Um, you, it's one of the reasons that the strong aesthetic really works is because it's picked up by the media and it makes good photographs. And things like that. I think that's something we think about also in terms of reaching wider audiences. And so we're very lucky to be joined by someone here. Man, that was that one. Uh, we've been very um, studiously waiting for us, so thank you very much, Man, and thank you to all of you for sticking with us. Man is the final speaker on the panel, and we'll talk a bit about the website which he is co founder and founding, founding editor of. Um, and, um, so, if you could begin by talking a bit about that, Man, and then we can talk about some of your specific individual projects. Thank you. I'm sure I'll go with the drivers. I want to speak a little bit about how the artwork is received when it comes from the Arab world or when it's done by an Arab person. The situation nowadays is that the last thing the writer, the poet or the artist is had responsible for is the quality of their work that are held responsible or accountable for their uh, political opinion, for their discourse, for dealing with certain issues, but uh, quality is always neglected. And this happens in uh, the both sides of the world, in the West and in the East. In the past 20 years, we didn't see a lot of criticism in the Arab world, but we found that the critical uh, articles are either on the news, like for example, this album was issued, it was produced by this and that on that date, and that's it. Or it's some kind of a moral accountability for the artist. For example, this artist didn't go to that uh, demonstration that happened in the Tahrir Square or this uh, artist is racist, or is this and that, or he is not leftist enough or rightist enough. These are always questions that are not related at all to the artwork, and this is a big problem. In the West, their only interest in the artist is through him or her being a victim. So, as an Arab, you can produce art only as being a victim or when you want to speak about victims. So, through this inferiority, you are a victim, so it's not a problem if your work is bad and this is another disaster. Through music, we wanted to present one criteria, which is quality. Okay. Um, where was where was I? What we are trying to do in Ma'azif is to present a sort of criticism only related to quality. Many people will find it it's a part of a formalist school, but that's what we are trying to focus on, quality. And our website is only in Arabic because we are trying to build a criticism discourse with the public, with the audience, before uh, uh, reaching the description because when talking about Um Kulthum in English we cannot uh, uh, write about it without about her without explaining whom is she but when we talk uh, or when we sp uh, write in Arabic we have a common ground that we can uh, that we can start from and then we can translate uh, these articles but uh, start to write 
in English about the Arabic uh, and Arab art is uh, something that we cannot do. And uh, because we have to make very long introductions, that's what you are working on. And sometimes we try to do some things that are considered to be uh, problematic. We wrote an article about the artist George Rasul, and uh, many people uh, criticized us criticized us for that because but we said that we are not discussing the ethics of George Wasu but his art we are not asking people to see George Wasu as a symbol of good manners but as an artist so we are trying to focus on art on quality and the dialogue among us as Arabs in order to reach new concepts and new ideas. Thank you. Thank you so much, man. Now, I'm afraid we're going to have to draw the panel to a close, although you've opened up many cans of worms with your last intervention, and including whether or not it's possible really to separate art from the world that surrounds it and art from the ethics of the artist uh, and the, the marketing and marketization of victimhood and violence. But we're just going to save that for another day. And we have to end. Yeah? You want to? Okay. Okay, fine. Uh, fine. That's great. Okay. It's good we've got an extension. So, if you want to go straight into the second one. We'll all stay here. Okay. No, no, they're complaining. You can negotiate that. Are there some burning questions in the audience? Please feel free. We can take one or two. Uh, oh yes, yes, please. Uh, I just had a uh, uh, little bit because the, uh, the ethics are related to some rules and uh, one can liberate himself from rules uh, from time to time. So is the question clear or... My second question for Tanya, can you please tell us more about the technique you used in the garden speaking. And a question to Man. I am a musician and I really love your website that is 
where I can find references and uh, I would like to tell you that I really appreciate the website you were saying that you are focusing on quality but I would like to ask about the criteria how do you define the criteria uh, concerning the things that you will mention or you will tackle yes or no Thank you. So we can go through them one at a time in a moment. Hi, uh, I think it was a very interesting valid point that you brought up about the victimization or in a way even the glorification of victims, especially coming from the Western world. Which also applies to other marginalized groups, and I, I work a lot in this way, and that question always continues to come back in the rehearsal room, how we can avoid these. And I wanted to ask from your opinion, or anyone else on the panel, um, how do you think we can deal with this issue? Yes. Uh, I would like to link two ideas I heard today in the session. Is the first one about creative revolution, new ideas, new movement, and to give us time to really digest maybe and um, know if we are in this new era or new. And um, the idea of a lack of the need of a critical. Uh, critical um, text writing as well. And I think the two are linked. Because uh, the, the missing of the critical reading is also uh, maybe an aspect of not knowing if we are in this great movement or not. And uh, in fact, I am really, uh, being North African, uh, Algerian, Moroccan, uh, whatever. I do uh, experience uh, these uh, uh, difficulties of communicating and uh, uh, reading the other. Uh, we do have uh, quite a very rare occasion to see works, art work from Middle East in North Africa and vice versa, but we also have uh, lack of writing and critical text between us. Like uh, if we meet, uh, how we can talk and have a critical dialogue on what we are doing. On uh, artwork, eh? I'm talking about process and artwork, I'm not talking about uh, So that's really interesting me how we can build to have this, because I am also fed up with all the newspaper saying that uh, we had a hundred person coming, they went, and the minister was there or not there, and that's all. And I, so, uh, how can we create this uh, critical, interesting uh, writing and record what we are doing because it's going very fast this last year. This transformative time needs to be recorded and I think we can take this occasion of this meeting to think about it. طبعا احنا في اول شيء بالنسبه للحريه التعبير او التعبير يعني كثير عجبني هذا كيف المفرق بيناتهم كيف الواحد يعمل هذا اولها as a Palestinian, I can tell you more about how they show you as a victim. And then in 10 or 15 years, they will tell you stuff. It's enough, enough talking about that. And uh, they use the term of conflict. We are not living in conflict. It is not a conflict. It is an occupation. And it is made for the government. And yes, what happened in Iraq? It was an occupation. Uh, sometimes I'm really fed up with uh, terms. And of course, I am very interested in the quality issue. When we visit the uh, Arab festival, they don't give a lot of emphasis on the participation of the Palestinian representations and delegations. 
So maybe there's uh, something behind all this, I don't know. As if Palestinians cannot present anything that is beautiful, anything, uh, anything that is related to art, etc. If you want to talk about the cultural movement in Palestine, it is a very active movement, even though we have occupation. Sometimes they try to trivialize that, uh, and uh, uh, it is a shame that the embassies are not taking that into consideration. The Palestinian embassies around the world are not taking that into consideration. Are not not shedding light on uh, our work, on our artistic work. And now, uh, I want to say that sometimes some political works are very good, very creative, where we have a lot of aesthetics, and through uh, innovation and fantasy, we were able to send a message, a very important message, and thank you. So, so we need to, we really need to wrap up the panel a lot more. So, I can ask just the panelists to give their final wrap up remarks. Try to stick, up, stick to about one minute each if possible. I'll do it in reverse order this time. So, I'll start with man. وأبدأ مع معا هذه المرة ومن ثم إنها مسألة فلسفية not uh, subject, uh, not objective, but subjective. We cannot uh, uh, have our impression objectively on the arts. This is a big lie. Uh, we take into consideration concerning the standards. Uh, if it's something new, if it's exciting, if it is developing this type of music, or was it that bad? So we need to clarify why is it bad. I won't be giving you examples, uh, though they are uh, essential, but I don't have time. Concerning victimization, the problem is that if the artist is not from the West, don't have the right to talk about the very essential and uh, essential issues such as parenthood, jealousy, love. Uh, love needs to be under the uh, bonds, etc. But the experience of someone living all this, such as uh, the person living under persecution, uh, is, can be reversed. And we can say that a person living in this environment tried oppression but tried as well in parenthood. So maybe his human experience is larger and, that, larger and that's why he can express more about some humanitarian issues. How can we develop that language, first of all, and the presence of a critical Arab movement? Because now London, Paris, etc., are defining what is, uh, and Berlin now, are defining what is a good Arab art, but we have to define the good Arab art. And maybe not now, but after. Uh, but the situation is bad. Concerning the Palestine, I am very pleased you've mentioned uh, Palestine because I'm Palestinian as well. The question is, uh, the, uh, is the objective of the art to send a message or the objective of the art is art uh, in itself? I do believe it's art. And now, in Palestine, if you see whom is very famous, you can notice that there are people that are taking advantage of the Palestinian situation, uh, while uh, people such as Camila Jubran and Tabra Bouhazali and Mukata that are trying to do something new uh, are barely uh, uh, known. 
so no no quality in Palestine now. I don't have many things to add since we are uh, running out of time, but I want to answer your uh, question concerning how not or how to respect uh, quality and abide by a certain form. I didn't uh, feel that well. I never felt that I was uh, uh, presenting compromises uh, in terms of language, in terms of uh, messages, political messages, etc., because the uh, artistic uh, language have uh, some political content and meaning, and because my theater is a, an interactive theater where people uh, always interact with the artist, and that is a platform for innovation. We don't have something abstract that uh, we are trying to offer compromises uh, on. Concerning the technique, I will need uh, much more uh, time, but uh, the uh, speakers are uh, uh, telling, each speaker is uh, telling one story related to one program. And, uh, that, uh, and the speaker will start telling the story once the, uh, the audience is in. Mohammed, how do you want to give Art, culture are very important in times of crisis, violence, and war. But the quality, the quality of our work need to be at the level of the quality that we can see in countries where there's no violence. Uh, the Palestinian cinema is one of the most important uh, productions in all the uh, region. It is even better than the Egyptian uh, production, not because they are victim, but because they are working well. أنا فقط أريد أن أقول أن العمل extent it is relevant to the here and now and the moment where it is. And it answers the question who the viewers are, what kind of existence they have, what kind of effect uh, artwork exercise, like Garden speaks. I would say that it changed my life. I would say very easily that it was the first time I cried after the Syrian revolution. Uh, it was in Garden speaks. Uh, so um, that's it, I think. It's where the artwork uh, is a life-changing experience, uh, and it, when, when the, so it becomes a third space, when it becomes, it's where imagination becomes a solution. This is where artwork uh, is, uh, is absolutely um, linked to its content. Thank you so much. I'm sorry to rush you. Uh, and Judith, if I could ask you. Uh, very quickly. I'm, I agree with the everybody said on the panel, I absolutely don't think that, that aesthetics and, and musical art and politics are, are separate things. I think you can make extraordinary political work in a very beautiful and aesthetically brilliant way. Um, I think there's no harm in sending a message. We need to be sending messages. And if that work is so deep and so strong, and the fact that Tanya has ten people at a time, if they can make Alma and me cry, then we go away and we tell our cousins and our aunties and uncles and our nephews and our friends that this was the most moving thing we've seen and that, even though hundreds of people can't see this at a time, the depth of that experience and the, and the beauty of how to put together are the things that make us talk about it. So I think that's, it, the small bits doesn't worry me in the end because it, the, the news spreads. And I take the thing about victimisation but I think it's how the work is presented it has to be with respect on every side. And believe you me, coming from where I come from, the more we can send a message about what's happening and how it happened, then it is really important we do that through beautiful art. Uh, 
censorship. And here uh, we are talking about uh, two words uh, uh, pertaining to the same uh, family and the authors uh, need uh, not to take into account uh, any of those uh, two aspects. Uh, concerning the aesthetics, they are very important and necessary for any artwork because uh, art should be an entertainment, but an entertainment in the service of the mind of uh, the culture. So we need to accompany it with uh, innovation. And uh, the artwork don't have to be, doesn't have to be a, uh, a tradition, but an innovation. And uh, we cannot predict if uh, the art that we are producing is we will know later on, and history will give the, uh, the, uh, the characteristic of the quality to our work and the aesthetic to our Thank work. Thank you so much, Rajayan. Thank um, you. I Shukran. apologize again for the uh, run over on the panel, but I guess that's what you get when you get a room full of brilliant people together. So thank you to all of you, and thank you to all the panel. Thank you.